Thank you to my wife for that story. I hadn't heard that story in a while. I was fascinated. She had me uh, drilled in there for that. Thank you. And uh, thank you to our music team for leading in worship and our pianists. It's lovely to come to church for Sabbath and worship on his day. I don't know how many of you had a chance to look at the announcement about calling in for a special prayer time at 5.30 in the morning. Did anybody try to do that this week and couldn't get through? What? Nobody tried? All right. Okay, so let me share a little secret with you. In the book of Acts, when the people prayed, Peter was let out of jail. We have people that are bound in certain sets of circumstances, serious ones, and I'd invite you, if you got a moment at 5.30 a.m., to join in on this prayer conference. We don't know what God will do, but he won't do it if we don't ask him. So let's pray. Is that all right? Okay. So um, we had a few hiccups, and even so I I had to ask if anybody tried, because we got the wrong number earlier in the week out. And so I'm glad no one tried and was discouraged <laughs> because we had the wrong number. I, trust, I, I believe this is the right number here. So if you have a moment at 5.30 in the morning, uh, dial in and let's, let's pray. Uh, we have some, some uh, serious needs that we need to bring before the Lord. Well, uh, before we get started in God's Word this morning, I'd invite you again to pray where you're at. And I'm going to kneel and pray up here and ask the Lord to bless His Word. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be in your house of worship this morning. We want to hear a word from you. And so, Lord, we ask for forgiveness of our sins and the cleansing from all unrighteousness. Let there not be anything that would uh, keep us from hearing your word. And, Lord, I need a blessing to speak your word. I ask that you will uh, send a coal from your altar and touch my lips. Lord, thank you for the inspiration you have here. Thank you for the hope that it brings, the encouragement, the correction, the instruction that your word has in it. Uh, Bless us now, we pray, for Jesus' worthy namesake. Amen. So we're covering the topic in the Bible of spiritual gifts, particularly the gift of prophecy and prophets. This is a a topic that is... uh, it's uncomfortable when you bring it up in, in a public place. You say, to, uh, have you, do you believe in prophets? Most people think like, what? What? What did you say? And uh, so this isn't a common topic of conversation that I overhear people talking about in Taco Bell or in, you know, when I'm at a restaurant or on the airplane. I just don't hear people having that conversation. What? was your experience with studying into prophets and prophecy today? You know, I just don't hear that. But it is an important topic in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is covered with prophecy and prophets, isn't it? And God's word was spoken and written down through his prophets, his messengers, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we want to understand a little bit about them. And as Christians and believers in the Bible, we'll recognize how important prophets were to the health and viability of God's people in the Bible. In fact, I would like to suggest to you, when the body is being wrecked, when God's body, his people, his church is being wrecked, God uses the sure word of prophecy to hold it together. Does God's body ever get wrecked? Did Jesus die on the cross for us? His body was wrecked that day. And he established his body and his people, his church. And has his body, his people ever suffered a wrecking at the hands of Satan? They have. And in fact, it says in Daniel, there's a prophecy that says that the power of God's people will be completely broken, right? God's people get wrecked sometimes. But God uses the gift of prophecy And he sends prophets to try to hold things together. And in the end, those who, according to Revelation 1-3, who hear the words of the prophecy of this book, are held together through the blood and the love of Jesus to arrive at the gates of the New Jerusalem 
for a life where there is no more crying, tears, pain, suffering, death evermore. It will all be taken care of. So the gift of prophets is, a, is an amazing uh, gift in the Bible. And we are there in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And I'd like to just continue on down to verse 21. So if you have your Bibles, we'll turn to various places in them today. It says, and the King James Version says this, I'm reading from the New King James, but I'm going to substitute the King James wording here because I like it better. Is that all right? It says, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. So the New King James, if you want to know what it says, it says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. But we have a more sure word of prophecy, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So first of all here, we have a sure word of prophecy, and that is one thing this world wants to make sure. It seems to be uncertain that the word of God is uncertain rather than sure. After all, they say, how many interpretations of Scripture are there out there? As many churches as you can find, there's a different interpretation, isn't there? Does that mean that the Bible is not sure? No, because the word is the same, right? Right? So people get discouraged for reading the Bible because everybody has something a little bit different to say about the Bible. What they need to do is not listen to what people say about the Bible, but get in the Bible and read it, right? Because the sure word is right here. It's not what I say about it. It's not what the next person down the street in that church says about it. But it's what the sure word itself says, right? So we want to get in the Bible and and read the sure word because this is the sure word right here. And it's full of the sure word of prophecy. And it has, uh, what do we have here in this text? It says, knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, the Bible interprets itself. So if we have somebody coming along and, and saying, well, I, I think because I read the news headlines this morning that it fits this particular passage, that that's what it means, right? Well... It may or may not. You have to go into the Bible and dig in the Bible backwards and forwards. Here a line, there a line. Here a little, there a little. Line upon line, precept upon precept, the Bible says. We go back and forth in the Bible and find from the Bible what the definition and terms mean. And we come up with a sure word that way. Not what we feel like what it says. The Bible must interpret itself. If we don't understand what a portion says in one area, when we run across another area, that area can give us light on the area that was unclear. In fact, Psalms 119 says that the entrance of your word brings light. Light. So, the Bible is not a book of confusion. It's not a book of uncertainty. It is a book full of the surety and the light of God, not full of darkness. So, we have here, knowing first that the prophecy of of Scripture is not of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Most of the guys that were called to be prophets in the Bible, most of the people that had the prophetic gift, they're like, God, this is a little bit dangerous. It wasn't usually something that someone willed up. In fact, the Bible says it wasn't by the will of man. God looked down, he saw someone that he could use, that he wanted to use, and he chose them. And very often, he got pushback. Moses was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, right? And Moses was pushing back. Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go down to Egypt. I don't want to be your spokesperson. I don't, I don't, I don't. He came to Ezekiel one day, and Ezekiel says, I don't want to do this. God says, it's okay. You won't be able to speak for a while until you want to. (laughs) Jeremiah didn't want to do this. God says, it's okay. I'll make your face like a flint. I know people aren't going to listen to you, but I'm going to make you be able to be able to stand up to their resistance. So he calls 
these individuals, and it wasn't just men, there were women as well. We have Deborah, we have Hulda, we have seven daughters of Philip in the New Testament. Uh, we have, or the, yeah, the daughters of Philip, we have, uh, so we have men and women receiving this gift of prophecy in the Bible. The God communicating his word to his people through prophets. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verses, I'm sorry, not 1, 11 through 13. And we remember our, our kind of our thesis here. When the body is being wrecked, God uses the sure word of prophecy to hold it together. And we're going to look here in verse uh, 11 through 13, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets. And I'm going to skip down now to verse 13. Well, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints. Then verse 13, till we come to the unity, Right? So we come to the unity. So these gifts of these individuals, these prophets, and there's other ones there too, pastors and teachers and whatnot, but we're focusing in on prophets. They are given till we come into the unity so that these things were to hold, help hold the body of Christ together in hard times. Let's dig back into the Old Testament and find a hard time. It was a hard time. We have a, a king whose mother is Athaliah. Athaliah's mother was Jezebel. So the king, he uh, through unforeseen but could have been avoidable circumstances if he listened to the prophets, he is killed by Jehu. So Jehu is sent to give judgment on Ahab's house. Because remember Ahab had taken this vineyard? He had stolen and taken possession. Jezebel had killed God's prophets to the point where Elijah felt like he was the only one left. And so um, Jehu's on his way to fulfill God's mandate for judgment on northern Israel. But this other guy from Judah, he is up there visiting, and Jehu's like, well, since you're here and we're taking care of business, we're going to take care of you too. And so Jehu kills this guy, as well as the king of the northern ten tribes. And you can read the story. They came out, well, I don't want to go into the story. You can read about it. They came out to meet him in a chariot, and when they found out it was Jehu, both of them started to flee, and Jehu draws an arrow and shoots them both as they're fleeing. And so they both die in their chariots as they're fleeing the scene of meeting up with Jehu. Well, Athaliah has a, a bee in her bonnet and she decides, you know what, I am going to kill all the royal family and this place is going to be mine. And she decided that she was going to rule. And let's turn to this story. If you have your Bibles, you can get into the ugly details of it in Second Chronicles chapter 22, verse 10. It says, Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. But Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Can you imagine growing up for six years in a bedroom? Not being able to go anywhere, not being able to get out, not being able to, I mean, and you're constantly, you, you know what, there's somebody that's looking for you to kill you and we want to preserve your life because we believe that you should be king someday. 
So the day finally arrives. He turns seven. Verse chapter 24. Joash was seven years old when he became king and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. It's an interesting story how he became king. They set him up. You know, Jehoiada is the, the priest of the temple and he brings him out there and he has all the guards of the temple and the uh, you know, in the Bible times, they had captains of tens, captains of fifties, captains of hundreds, captains of thousands, and then they had the over-captains of the army. Well, Jehoiada makes a covenant with the captains of hundreds. I find this interesting. He didn't go to the ones, the captains of thousands. He didn't go to the captains of tens. He went to the captains of hundreds, and he's like, you know what, if I can get all the captains of hundreds to support this idea, the captains of thousands can't do anything about it because the captains of hundreds are already going to do this. And so uh, he gets these captains of hundreds and they're all ready to defend the king to the death. Athaliah comes screaming in, treason, treason, and they take her out. And of course he is made king and she loses her life. And it says there was peace in the land. So Joash is doing what is right. Now King Jehoiada, he lives for an interesting long time for this time period. He lives till he's 130 he lives till he's 130, and the whole time that he's living, Joash is doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord, because Jehoiada wants to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. He's the priest of the temple. The temple is run down. Athaliah's sons had wreaked havoc on it, taken the treasures out of it, put holes in the walls and such. So Joash sent out to bring in offerings to restore the temple of the Lord. People, he said, the told the Levites, do it diligently. It says in the Bible they didn't. So eventually he gets this chest, he puts it out, and people come and they drop their coins in it, they fill the chest up with money, and they repair the temple. But, verse 15 of Second Chronicles chapter 24, but Jehoiada grew old and was full of days and he died. He was 130 years old when he died, and they buried him in the city of David among the kings. He was a priest, but they buried him among the kings because he had done good in Israel both towards God and his house. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, God's people and his kingdom have suffered a wrecking. Athaliah has been reigning, killing people, all kinds of stuff. We've got this new king who wants to serve the Lord. He's been doing it all the days of Jehoiada. Now, it says up above in verse 10 of chapter 25 that when they did repair the temple, that all the leaders and all the people rejoiced when it happened. But now we have something interesting happening down here in verse 17. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, the leaders of Judah came and bowed to the king. And the king listened to them. Now, many times this is a good thing. Many times this is a good thing. But on this particular, I don't know what they told him, but we know what the results are because there's an if-then, therefore. And from what happened here, there is a therefore in verse 18. And it says, therefore, they left the house of the Lord, God of their fathers, and served wooden images and idols. So we have these leaders coming to Judah. They come from Judah. They come down and they bow down before the king. Their pretended honor brings darkness. Their pretended honor is deceptive. Their pretended honor is determined to take God's people in a different direction. And it says there in verse 18, And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespasses. What does the Bible say? Does it, does it say to make wooden images and bow down to them? No. Anytime when we do and go exactly opposite of where God is, wants us to go or where he's asked us to go and we do opposite, he's not obligated to bless that. Right? And so we can reap consequences from going that direction. But in verse 19, he does something very interesting. God doesn't just let them go and worship idols. 
He doesn't just leave them to their bad choices. God is a friend of sinners. And he wants to bring them back to himself. We learned this last time that one of the things about a prophet is that they're willing to tell people what no one else is willing to tell them. In Proverbs it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. And they test. Was it one prophet? It was prophets. I don't know how many. But there were many. He sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. And they testified against them. But they would not listen. So finally, there is one person that might be able to get Joash's attention. There was a boy that he grew up with. He played with in the temple. It was his only companion, his only friend, as he was isolated away from the wrath of Queen Athaliah. His name was Zechariah. He was the son of Jehoiada, the priest. And Zechariah is the new priest. And he comes to him and he says, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord? See, he is the only one that can really help. He's the closest friend there is that Joash has in this kingdom. He's the one he grew up with. Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Turn with me. Let's just pause here. Turn with me over to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Pause in the middle of this story. And we're going to go up to verse 124. And we're going to read down uh, several verses. You, you see, God had given his laws and his commandments as kind of a, a barrier against trouble. You know, you stay within this boundary, I can bless that. You get outside of this boundary, you go over the side of this boundary, I can't bless that. But as long as you stay here, within the parameters and the instructions I've given you, I can bless that. And so there's always the appeal to stay within the boundaries of God's commands. And if they strayed, there was provision for forgiveness because they could come to the temple and they could sacrifice a lamb and receive mercy and forgiveness and come back inside the boundary with God's power to stay there and be protected. So, verse 124, it says, Did I get that right? Okay. Deal with your servant according to your mercy and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. David recognized that there was a blessing in knowing God's statutes, knowing his testimonies, knowing the sure word of God. And then he says something that is interesting in 126. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void, or they have made void your law. But he says, therefore, I love your commandments more than gold. Yes, more than fine gold. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. You know, if we're having a problem in life, we can't seem to quite get through it. This was often the case with God's people in the Old Testament. And in answer to the dilemma, God would send a prophet. Now we may say, well, where's that prophet? You know, I would like to have a prophet. Well, would God send us a new prophet if we haven't read his old prophets? <laughs> Right? And oftentimes, people that would send a new prophet, and we're going to get into this next time, is what are the tests of the prophet? Because the Bible says, beware of false prophets. You know, there's true prophets, so we're going to get into the test of a prophet. You know, how do you know if one's real? One of the ways you know one's real is by knowing the prophets from the past. If you don't know the prophets from the past, there is no way to tell whether a prophet in the present is a good prophet or not. And so we go on here. He says, 
Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Look upon me and be merciful to me as your custom is towards those who, those who love your name. And then he has a wonderful prayer. Direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. As long as God's people followed this kind of heart cry, they were safe in God's hands every single time. When you read the stories... But here's what happened. Zechariah is appealing to Joash to keep the commandments of the Lord and not to transgress. He's appealing to him because he wants him to prosper. We serve a loving God who brought us out of the land of Egypt by a strong hand. You know, I'm sure he went through the stories with him. But don't forsake him. You've forsaken him. He also will forsake you. You know, we don't, God doesn't forsake us. He says in the Bible, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But if we forsake him, he doesn't force us to be around him, right? He doesn't. Verse 21, so they conspired against him. And at the command of the king Joash, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. This is in Solomon's temple that Solomon built in the court of the house of the Lord. There's stone pavement here. As he's dying, Joash says, Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but killed his son. And as he died, he said, Lord, look on it and repay. He knew it wasn't right. He knew there was justice to be had. And this is one thing about prophets. They're appealing to the mercy of God. Return to the mercy and the love of God. But when things go wrong, they say there's a God who loves so much he won't ever sanction wrong. Look on it and repay. Well, if you fast forward in your Bibles all the way to Matthew chapter 23, God himself is standing in the same spot through Jesus' son, that Zechariah was stoned. Or he at least was very familiar. The blood of Zechariah stained the pavement and was still there in Jesus' day. They're about to kill Jesus, they're going to wreck his body on the cross next. And Jesus, with tears in his voice and tears coming down his face, he says in Matthew 23, verse 33, he says, Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And then in verse 37, Jesus is crying again, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who, what, kills the... The prophets. Is it ever a good idea to have a mocking skeptical tone against prophets and prophecy? Thessalonians says, despise not prophecy, but test all things. Hold to that which is true. See, our world wants to get the idea that prophets and prophecy are the most stupid thing in the world that we could ever have in a conversation piece. But in the Bible, they're some of the most revered individuals that God has sent to his people. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. 
See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right then, Jesus is uttering a prophecy. And of course, in Matthew 9, uh, Revelation 19, we find that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's the prophecies that pointed to Jesus' first coming. The prophecies pointed to his second coming. And prophets come all along the way asking people and crying out, asking people to repent of their sins and turn to a Savior who has given his life for them. Were they popular? The majority, most of the time, did not want to hear what a prophet had to say. And it's no different today, and it's going to be no different tomorrow, and it's going to be no different in our day and age. We'll go back to our thought here. When the body is being wrecked, God uses the sure word of prophecy to hold it together. He holds it together by the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb. And do you know what? We can take the sure word of prophecy. We're not necessarily going to be prophets in the same way. But we also can have the testimony of Jesus. We also, through the blood of the Lamb and the testimony He gives us, through a life changed by His word, can also share a sure word of prophecy that comes from the prophets through his word. What do you think the burden of a modern day prophet would be? If there was a prophet that were to show up today, what do you think their burden would be? What do you think their message would be? I think it would be what they've always been. What the message has always been is that God is love. God is love. God is a friend of sinners. He's got a law of love that he honors that is a blessing when we stay within his boundaries. And that if we slip out, we may receive forgiveness at his hands and mercy at his throne. And our burdens are lifted at Calvary. That's been the message of prophets from the past through the Bible, through the Gospels. What, distract us, what distracts us from this message? I didn't listen to Pastor Greenway's sermon last week, but I heard about it. And I agree that our possessions, our work, and our relationships become the modern-day idols that keep us somehow from following the full message that the prophets would have for us to have our relationship with Jesus, doing what he wants us to do. I believe that is exactly right on. We think maybe we don't bow down to idols and get wrecked the same way they did in the Old Testament. They're just different. We don't carve out a wooden image, bow down to it. But we have things that can get in the way of God's will, don't we? We do. Satan wants to turn what God gives us. Does he give us possessions? Does he give us work? Does he give us relationships? They're gifts of God that he gives us. But he wants those to be in the proper perspective underneath his will. Not a distraction from his will. Not an attraction from his will. But to be used according to his will. But we get outside. We do what we do. The Bible says, there's a verse in the Bible that says, other gods we have had besides you. Have you ever felt that way in life? You get down on your knees. It's like, Lord, I need a closer walk with you. And it's like, I've had other gods besides you. I want them all out. I only want God. God and God alone to be number one in my life. Nothing else in between. God hears those kinds of prayers. And he answers them. The title of the sermon I titled Gifts of the Body, but maybe I should entitle it Gifts to the Body because 
You see, the, the body of Christ can still get wrecked in this world. Do you ever feel a wrecking going on in your life? Doesn't always feel smooth, doesn't always feel like it's going in the right direction. Sometimes it feels like it's crumbling, sometimes it feels like it's just hard to go the next step. God understands. Jesus understands. He understood when he was on Calvary. He knows what it's like. But he sends us a sure word to be with us because in those wrecking moments, things can seem so uncertain. Christ on the cross says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It can feel like a forsaking moment when things are getting wrecked in life. But you know what kept Jesus in that moment, in that hour, when it felt like God had forsaken him, to him. You know that verse comes from Psalms 122. I'm so, sorry, Psalms 22. And at the end of Psalms 22, I'm sure he didn't have just that line where it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm sure he didn't have just that one memorized. I think he had the whole psalm memorized. And at the end of that psalm, there is a wonderful testimony, a prophecy that he would latch his eyes onto, even if he wasn't feeling it there on the cross, it says in that psalm, a posterity will serve him because of this. He couldn't see through the portals of the grave, but he could latch onto a promise of God, a sure word of prophecy, and stay there on the cross for you and I. And if he can do that, and he did do that, he gives us the same words that when we get in those expiring situations, we can latch on to the sure word of God to get through it. May our prayer always be Lord, order my steps in thy word and let not iniquity have dominion over me. May I always be loyal to your love. You know, our closing hymn is called Will Your Anchor Hold? It's number 534. You know, there's going to be more winds of strife in this world. They're, they're happening. And... The Bible in Revelation says that it will only get worse. There may be times of peace here and there, and we can praise the Lord for those. But generally speaking, we can expect to face headwinds and hardship and difficulty. And the song asks us the question, will your anchor hold? I don't know if you've ever been out on a, on a boat trying to stay in one place when there's lots of currents going this way and that, but you need an anchor to keep that thing there. You know, maybe you're at your favorite fishing spot or wherever it is, but the wind is wanting to drift you this way. You throw an anchor overboard and it helps you stay in one place. Stay where you need to be. So the song asks us, will your anchor hold? And it says, will it be anchored to the rock? So I want to make a suggestion here. You know what the rock is. Who is the rock? The rock is Jesus. What is the anchor to Jesus? I want to suggest that it's his word, you know. The song doesn't really write out, come and say it, but I'm going to suggest that to you. There may be other things. That's why you have to study the Bible yourself. There's probably other things that are anchors. But I'm going to suggest to you that it is his word that is the anchor that keeps us to Jesus. Jesus is the rock that we want to hang on to, but it's a lot easier when we hang on to him through his word. Everybody that I've ever met that has had an opportunity to be in a suffering situation that is a Christian, they want more than anything else a Bible. A Bible. And so God's Word, I believe, is the anchor that keeps us anchored to Jesus. So will your anchor hold in the winds of strife? Let's challenge ourselves with that thought as we close this morning. And only through the power of the Holy Spirit can we each individually answer it. Will your anchor hold?